During Sunday school, we discussed that we're going to be now the, um, the plaid Baptist. So, so I don't feel out of place. Mary got me a shirt that would just hang that up. Put that right up front here. here we go. All right. We are in. <laughs> I'm so glad we could have fun here. Anybody who comes through this door just sees that we don't have fun. They're not hearing or seeing what's happening. <laughs> but we're in uh, the book of Mark this morning. Mark chapter 10. I'm going to start at, at verse 13. Do I sound too loud or I sound okay? Sound okay? Okay, good, good. Just making sure. All right. It's page, uh, sorry, page 1058 if you're using your pew Bible. Uh, page 1058. Let's do three verses, 13 to 16. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who would not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I thank you for this wonderful day. Lord, I just thank you for the blessings you have given to us. Lord, and I thank you for your word. pray that the Holy Spirit can come and, and open up our hearts and our eyes and our minds, Lord, and then apply what you will teach us this morning. I pray this in your holy, precious name, Jesus. Amen. Before we get started, um, I just want to brag a little on Pastor Jay. Those of you, um, you guys known him for a long time. I've only been here for five and a half, five years or so. Anyway, um, I've lost count, but it's been, it's been so good I've lost count. But um, this last Friday, or, or Friday before last, I, I went to a, a conference down in Bangor, a one-day conference, and it was about revitalizing churches and about, about making churches, the old established churches, bringing life back to them again. And they gave us this little sheet to go and circle what, what stage are we in? Are we, are we almost dead? You know, it, it, they almost stage it like cancer stages. Your stage one is like, okay, there's a good chance you survive. And stage four is like, you better be looking for a new job. Um, and, and then there was like the healthy stages. And I looked at them and I, and I was like, my goodness, all the things that they suggested to do to revitalize a church, Jay's done. And I just was going through the list and, and, and just with, with meetings with Jay and stuff, I saw, and I thought, this is, this is awesome. And I want to share that with you guys because we are in the stages now where, where uh, we could begin to see some exciting growth, not necessarily in numbers, but, but in, in us and just us going to the community and, and different things like that. And I'm, I'm seeing that, and I think I'm being part of that, not, not because of anything I've done, but because of, of, I'm standing on the foundation Jay has laid. So thank you, um, I'm Jay, for God giving you wisdom, you following that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 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 all it's all good. I I, I love working uh, uh, with Jay, and actually that that brings us uh, to the beginning of of the message. Um, actually, about earlier this month, Jay and I met. We usually meet at, at Dunkin' Donuts. Um, it just I, I don't I don't object to that at all, and and. Jay likes to challenge me, which I, which I love, and uh, he has a lot of wisdom and a lot of experience. And so he said, Andrew, you know, I would think it would be really good if we, could, if we could pray and think about what the congregation needs to hear. Um, he said, I'm going to be starting a, a series on the attributes of God. And, um, and I was like, wow, I don't think I can do anything like that, but <laughs> I am going to pray and, and, and see of, of a series that, that, that God wants me to do. And, and uh, um, Jay... Jay, Jay really, really, really challenged me there. And, and something, um, and then by the way, the attributes of God, if you've missed any, any, any sermons, they've been really, really good. Uh, go online and, and watch them. There was a one I missed and I was able to watch later on, and it was just, just a really, really good series uh, so far. I'm looking forward to, the, to it continuing. Um, but, I, so I've been praying about it. What, what, what does God want them to hear? And I think oftentimes God puts in my life 
things to share with others. And something that I, I've been going through is, is grace. What is, what, is God's, what is God's grace? So I started to just do start, start a series, and I don't know how long it'll go, but I'm going to start a series on, on, on God's grace. And I think we all know that word grace, right? We say it, we sing it, we sung it this morning. But I, I really don't think we fully comprehend what it means, what it really means when it's coming from God. M many times we, we are far too hard on ourselves, and, and we, we think that God only loves us by our performance, but we tell others to live by grace. And oftentimes we might even look at others and, and not be gracious to them, but I, but I think that often stems from us not understanding, not fully comprehending what grace is. And when we understand that, I think that we're able to, to draw from that well of, of knowledge of what God's grace has done to us and share that with others and, and give that to others. With, with that said, you might be wondering, well, what does Mark chapter 10, verses 13 and 16, have anything to do with, with grace? Well, I believe, I, I, I like this passage, I believe children are a great example of the way God extends his grace. Jesus took time to, to minister to children all the, all the time. You look through passages, there's always children in, in the midst. And on one occasion, when, when he was feeding the 5,000, right, it was a boy that had the two loaves and, and, I mean, the two fish and the five loaves, right? Disciples didn't go looking for him. He was there and presented Jesus with that. And we see that in, in John chapter 6. And then in, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus called a little child to him and had him stand um, among the disciples. In this passage, you, you kind of get the, the impression that, again, Jesus didn't go looking for the, for the child. The child was there. And, hey, hey, come here. Stand up, stand amongst me and, and the disciples. I have an illustration to make. So children were probably constantly surrounding Jesus. And, and when Jesus made his last entry into, into Jerusalem, the children were actually the ones shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Isn't that pretty amazing? The children loved Jesus. And you can see that in, in Matthew chapter 21, verse 15. Then a few chapters later in Matthew 22, verse 37, we read what Jesus says about Jerusalem. He says, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. So in our passage today, we see that, that Jesus extends grace to children in, in a rather unique way. On cue, buddy. Good job. <laughs> that kid is so much fun. So since, since children matter to Jesus and, and should therefore matter to us, this passage challenges us, I, I think, with three action steps. And I want you to keep in mind, when I use the word children... While we could think of, yes, physical age children, I also want us to think of children, new believers in Christ, and that, that we are all God's children. So keep, keep that in mind as I'm going through this. First, we're to, to let them come. The first thing we need to do in relation to children is to, is to let them come. Let them come to Jesus. Notice in verse 13 that people were bringing little children to Jesus. The way it is stated here, it tells us, the reader, that this maybe was a, a normal occurrence. It, it, it would have been customary. Parents rightfully trusted Jesus. And I, I am sure that there are many unrecorded interactions with Jesus and children. And that, that he would have drawn a lot more children to him than, than we see in, in the Bible. But as, as many of you know, children can oftentimes be a distraction. Right? You know, uh, I, I think we're the ones that have a hard time concentrating. A child jumps in. Amanda and I, at, if you've ever been to our house for any meal time, one of the wishes Amanda and I have is just to have a, a conversation where we can hear each other during a meal time. But usually it's interrupted often. Like, Mommy, I don't like this. Can you? He's touching me. No, he looked at me wrong. Just eat your food. And so, and so, but at the same time, I know that if they weren't there, and, and eventually when they grow up and they're gone, I'm going to miss that interaction, and it, it'll probably be more silent than, than I 
would like. See, so, so the disciples are probably in the same boat that Amanda and I are at, are at the table where they see this disruption, they see these children coming, and, and they rebuke them, probably saying things like, don't bother Jesus, stop running all around him, he has more important things to attend to right now. And, and the word rebuke here is, is really actually kind of strong. It's the same word that is used when Jesus rebuked the, the wind and, and the sea in Mark chapter 4. It means to be muzzled, like shut your mouths. Nobody wants to hear you right now. So it, it has the idea of strictly forbidding something with the threat of punishment if the command is not obeyed. And that's often how we speak to our children when we do it one more time. Well, see, what they didn't realize, though, that Jesus, he really did, didn't mind at all. He didn't mind these children at all. He actually valued the children and their presence. Far too often, many forget the importance of children and the amazing things that they can actually teach us. Often, children are, are kind of just tolerated in settings, right, and not seen as, as a valuable part of society until they themselves maybe can start contributing to society. And we, uh, oftentimes we see them as a drain. I think that's, that's what's wrong with a lot of societies uh, today. They, they, children become expendable from conception all the way even after they're born. But verse 14 tells us that, that Jesus was actually indignant with the disciples. The word in, indignant comes from the compound word meaning to grieve much. This is the only time that we actually see, that's actually what, a, what a commentary told me, I'm going to believe it, this is the only time we actually see the word indignant in the New Testament. And this made Jesus both angry and extremely sad, right? Because no one should ever, ever make children feel unimportant, let alone his disciples. And, and we, his present day disciples, should never make children feel unimportant. And I ask myself, how many times have I grieved Jesus because I, I didn't make a child feel important, feel he was worthy or she was worthy of talking to me? This is a really important that, that we don't miss the emphasis Jesus is putting on children here. While he was using them as an example for us, he was also showing us that children are an extreme importance to him. This is why I, I love the good news clubs that we have in, in the schools and, and what CEF does there and what they do throughout the whole, the whole country. Because children are, are important and loved by God and they need to see that in tangible ways. We can't say God loves you and then ignore them, right? We need to be showing what, what, what God's love is and what that, what that means. So Jesus tells the disciples as, as much as he tells us in verse 14 to not hinder them from coming to him. And then in, in Matthew chapter 18, verses 5 through, through 6, Jesus gives a strong warning to anyone who might hinder a child from coming to him. It says, whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's a pretty strong punishment. <laughs> it would rather that you are thrown into the depths of the sea, which we don't even know how deep the sea is yet, than to make one of his children stumble. And again, we actually see in, in Mark chapter 9, when, when the disciples start arguing about who's the greatest and all that, and Jesus then, again, takes a child and says, unless you become like one of these, you won't ever be great. So many times, there are examples for us. So we need to see the importance of children and not only let them come to Jesus, but be an active part of leading them to Jesus. Secondly, I think we can learn from them. We need to learn from them. Notice the part of verse 14 and 15, which is, For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. In order to grow, we need to become more like little children. So why should we let little children come to Jesus? Why are we told not to hinder them? Well, there are at least two answers. For their sake, for our sake. 
We're to let them come. We're to learn from them. Children are valued for who they are, and they also serve as living pi pictures of a, of a deep spiritual truth here. Jesus did not say, don't hinder them, because to these belong the kingdom. He said, do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. To such as these, such as those who, who believe in him, who, who follow him like, like little children would. Instead of blocking their path, help them to come to Jesus for salvation because they represent the kind of people who will inherit the kingdom of God. Let's take a moment here and, and think about something. Why do you think God actually decided, you know what, for the human race to continue, I'm going to make sure that humans have little humans that are going to be fully dependent on the big humans until they are big enough to grow and have more little humans. I mean, there's many other ways that the human species can, that God could have created to, to, to appropriate, right? We, 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 we could appropriate to go, we could have had eggs, right? Yeah, snakes, they lay a bunch of eggs, all of a sudden they come out and there they go, they're taking care of themselves, like sea turtles. Parent lay the eggs, and good luck, hope you make it to the ocean before a bird gets you, right? I mean, there's, there's many different species in the animal kingdom that their babies are kind of, they fend for themselves from the beginning, but humans, babies are completely dependent on their parents. And, and, and the verse here says little children, not just children, but little children. The smaller the child, the more dependent it is on the parent. So I, I believe that the, one of the main reasons that children are, are, are great visual model for us is because of the kind of dependence and, and helplessness that children have. And it takes a certain amount of faith in a child, trusting that the parent is going to take care of them. Children can point us to grace, to God's undeserved favor that is poured out on the cross for sinners. As, as I start this series on grace, I want you to see how this passage demonstrates clearly that God's acceptance has nothing to do with what we've accomplished in our lives. His grace is given to those who really have done nothing. Children, right? They're attracted to Jesus. Not saying, hey, look what I did. But they're saying, I love this guy. He's just fun to be around, and I want to be around him. Grace is God giving to me something that I cannot obtain on my own. Grace is being accepted by God even though I do not deserve it, even though I am not worthy of it. Children embody this, especially maybe the ones who misbehave the most. Right? We still love them. I still love my children even after I discipline them. Jesus is saying that if you want to grow up spiritually, you, you must first become like a little child. Ephesians 5 verse 1 states that we are to be imitators of God as dearly loved children. The word children actually appears 482 times in the Bible, and the vast majority of those references is not referring to a person under the age of 12, but to individuals who are in a relationship with God. Spiritual maturity is described as childlikeness. God sees us as his children. That's exciting to me. I have a great and perfect father in heaven who loves me no matter what. And for those of us adults, if we want to become all that God wants us to be, we must learn from children. That means we must watch them. We must listen to them and even become like them. Become like them in, in their innocence, in, in their trust, in, in their faith in God. That's what children do. When my kids wake up in the morning, even though they might be grumpy sometimes, they know they're going to get breakfast. They know that mom has prepared school lessons for them. They know that they're going to have clothes. They know they have a roof over the head. These aren't things they worry about. And we as God's children, we shouldn't worry about these things either. And, and with that as well, 
I see a freedom in my children that I often see squelched in adults. My middle son, Isaac, he just, he just loves life. He just, everything excites him. The littlest thing, and he's saying, this is the best day ever. You know, he gets a peanut butter and says, this is the best day ever. <laughs> he just, just, and it's, it's amazing to me that the smallest things just excite him. He just loves everything about life. He goes outside, I see him playing on his own. Because he's not worried about things. Things aren't weighing him down. And God's saying, that's how I want you to trust me. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to shower grace on you. To bask in my glory. Thirdly, we're to intentionally love them. Intentionally love the children. Since, since children matter to Jesus and matter to us, we need to let them come. We need to learn from them. And finally, we need to intentionally love them. Look at verse 16 with me. It says, and he took the children, as Jesus, he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Verse 13 tells us that, that children were being brought to Jesus so that he could touch them, as he often does. Jesus went beyond what was asked of him, right? He didn't want to just, just touch them here. He bent down, he picked them up, put them in his arms, and he blessed them. He didn't have to bless them. They were not deserving of a blessing. But that's what Jesus did. That's how much he loved them. Jesus took time to demonstrate his love and, and his grace on them. Now, it was actually common for, for parents to take their children to a rabbi to receive a, a special blessing. Now, there's a book um, called The Blessings by Gary Smalley and, and John Trent that describe a typical family blessing during the time of Jesus. It contained five basic parts. Meaningful touch, and I'm going to go through these on, on the PowerPoint, um, but a spoken message, attaching high, high value to the one being blessed, picturing a special future, and an active commitment to fulfill the blessing. Now, I think we clearly see Jesus fulfilling the first three in this passage, and I believe we can safely assume that Jesus fulfilled the last two as well, even though it's not recorded, attaching it to this passage. We first see Jesus taking the children to his arms and providing that, that meaningful touch. The act of touch is key in communicating warmth, in communicating personal acceptance, in communicating affirmation, right? If my kids, if, I, if all I did was tell them every day that, that, that I loved them, but I never interacted with them, never gave them a hug, never gave them a kiss on the cheek, they would begin to question that, right? But interacting and hugging them and showing them that I love them through the, what, what I say plus by what I do, it, it reaffirms in them what, I, what I'm saying is true. Secondly, when Jesus blessed them, he did it with spoken word. In, in many homes today, words of love and acceptance are seldom spoken or, or heard. A blessing becomes so only when, when it, it's spoken, right? You can't really bless somebody if they never hear it. And this is what Jesus did, does here. Thirdly, the, the third thing I think we see him do is Jesus attached high value to the children. How can I say that? Well, the meaning of the verb to bless literally means to bow the knee. That's pretty amazing. So when the passage tells us that Jesus blessed the children, it means that he thought so much of them that he actually kind of showed reverence to them. And even all of them, you, you can say, continuing the theme of, of grace that we are going through with the series, it says this blessing was based on who they were, not on their performance. God saw, like, these children are important. I'm going to bless them. He didn't say, oh, look what this one did. I'm going to bless this one and not bless this one. Right? Jesus accepts us and loves us for who we are, for his children. The ne now, the next two elements in, in uh, out of five, we do not see recorded, but we can certainly see them being true of Jesus' character. The fourth element of the blessing is the way it pictures a, a special future of the person being blessed. Now, wouldn't it be great to know what Jesus actually said to these children? Someone actually recorded that. And I wouldn't be surprised if he told them about the ocean is full of blessings for them and store for them and commit, and that they need to commit themselves to be followers of God. But find that the, the last element of the blessing is, is the active commitment to seeing the blessing being fulfilled. Now, while he didn't do this here, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, when he tells the disciples, 
during, during his commissioning of the disciples to go out into the world, he, he says this to them, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And he's telling his disciples there, and I think he's the same with us, I'm going to see this blessing fulfilled. I'm committed to see it done. This is how Jesus graciously blessed children, and, and we can do the same to the children who come here and, and, and who are in our lives each and every day. We're to let them come to Jesus. We're, we're to learn from them, and we're to intentionally love them. Now, I, I like to close with pointing out that Jesus views all of us as his children. He does the same to us. He showers us with his gracious blessings. Many of us might not have grown up in homes that showed a lot of grace. This is often, though, what makes the gospel so attractive. It's that grace comes with it. Someone enters through those doors and we say, come as you are. God loves you. God meets you where you are. You don't have to clean yourself up first before presenting yourself to Jesus. He will clean you up as you come to him. We realize we no longer have to find our worth in what we have or have not accomplished. Do you know the grace God has given you? Do you realize he has come down and held you in his arms and he has blessed you? God has been really working in my life recently on, on this aspect of the gospel. So often many believers use the word grace and know the definition, but they do not live a life of grace or an understanding of what God has done for them. Because of this, I think a lot of us act like his disciples did here with, with the little children. We judge those who might seem like a nuisance to us, and we, maybe we rebuke those who we think might be bothersome to the church. Or we condemn those that we just don't agree with. All the while, Jesus is saying to us, let them come. Let me hold them. Let me bless them. Now, a couple of things that I have done to help me overcome these obstacles when not being able to extend grace and empathy is this. I view God's children just as that, as children, including myself. This is not a condescending view. This is not one saying, oh, they're just little children. This is one, the way I would, I would view a, a, a child, a lost child on a street. I would come to his aid and, and, and help him. This allows me to have more con compassion and understanding than I normally would have. This allows me to shower grace on them. Secondly, I've been challenging myself to really understand the gracious blessings God has given to me. And challenging myself, God, help me understand this. Let me be gracious to myself. I can be gracious with others. I often find it difficult to extend grace to others when I begin to forget what God has done for me and when I forget the gracious blessings he has bestowed upon me and that, that I am his child. We are each his children. So let us live our lives like little children, like his little children. God has called us. He has picked us up in his arms and he has graciously blessed us. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you again for who you are. Lord, I, I thank you that you have chosen us, Lord. That you sent your Son to die on the cross for our sins, Father God. And beyond that, you continue to bless us, Lord. That you love us not for anything that we have done. Lord, that we don't have to perform for you in any way. But Father God, I also just pray for each one of us here. I pray that as we go out into the world, that people can see that light shining through us, that we, could, that we can be that beacon of hope, that people could see graciousness flowing through us and be attracted to you because of that, Lord. Let all that we say and do give you honor and glory, because you are the only one worthy of it. And I pray this in your holy, precious name, Jesus. Amen.